Hello again, friends. Welcome to another episode of what we are calling Daily Manna. Uh, little Bible study here, and we're going to pick up where we left off last time. And before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your blessings. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit will be here with me here this evening as we are sharing this with our viewers. Ask that your Holy Spirit will touch each one who is watching this at this time and that your presence will be felt. We thank you for the Bible and for the messages that are in it for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a little recap. We talked about a couple of different things already. The first one was what happened in heaven. A um, little recap here. Romans 16 says God had a plan from before this earth was created. Job 38, 7 says that there was joy in heaven. Things were joyful and happy. God said that himself in a conversation he had with Joel or with Job. Ezekiel 28 says that Lucifer became proud and he wanted Jesus and God's position in heaven. He said he was going to be as the most high. And Isaiah 14 says that Lucifer fell from heaven. He was kicked out of heaven because he wanted God's throne. And then Revelation 12, the last book of the Bible, which I found is interesting in there, it's a little reminder of why we're in the mess that we're in today. Because Revelation is all about the last of the world's history, last day events, and things that were going on currently in heaven that John was shown in vision during that time, which uh, was about, a, about 80, 90 years after Jesus had been on this earth when he was in prison. And Revelation 12 says that there was war in heaven. And uh, again, that's just a little reminder of of why things are the way that they are as we're trying to figure things out in the last day events. Then we had creation. We talked about creation, Genesis chapter 1, the first day, the second day, the third day, and God saw that things were good. It gets down to the sixth day when he created man, and he says that it was very good. Why is that again? It's because we're created in God's image. And uh, that makes it very good. And I mentioned before that that's the reason uh, the devil's doing everything he can to, to hurt us, to maim us, whether it be through, through viruses or through pneumonias. Um, we've seen polio. We've seen the Black Plague. We've seen the Spanish flu. We've seen many of these things over the centuries. And uh, that is not a work of God. Even though your insurance policy says acts of God are not covered, I do not believe for a moment that God brings bad things upon the earth for his own enjoyment. I believe it is done because God allows Satan to do things his way because we all must make a decision. And Satan has to be shown his true colors. It's Lucifer. Has to be shown his true colors. And uh, we're going to pick up here on Genesis chapter 2 just for a moment. And then it says here, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, why do I go to church on, on the seventh day, on the Sabbath? It is because I am still remembering that God is my creator. And that is the reason that the Seventh-day Adventist Church still believes that we need to be resting and going to church on the seventh day. We do acknowledge that Jesus was, died on the cross for us. We're thankful for that. We're also very thankful that he was raised from the dead. If he had not been raised from the dead, Satan would have won. We're thankful that he, he uh, died that possibility of an eternal death for us and his sacrifice somehow don't understand it but somehow it was honored by God the Father because God sent the angels down and 
to get Jesus, wake him up and say, hey, your father's calling you. So this, the reason we keep the seventh day Sabbath is because in Genesis 2, 2, it says, I'll read it again. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. That right there, my friends, is the reason that we should keep the Sabbath. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Again, the seventh day Sabbath is a memorial to God's creation. It has nothing to do with the cross. It has nothing to do with sin. This happened before sin entered. It is memorial to God's creation that God is our creator and he rested and in the Garden of Eden, he came to Adam and Eve. And we'll get into that in a minute. He came to Adam and Eve, and he walked, and he talked with them. And Sabbath was a very special day. And it was a special day because it was a day of rest for them from tending the garden. And they were able to meet with their Creator. Now, we don't know how long that it had been. We don't know if, the, if Adam and Eve had been in the garden for a few days before sin came in. We don't know if they had been in the garden for a few weeks, maybe months, maybe years. We don't know because time really didn't start being taken track of until sin entered in. And we can, we can prove that through biblical study. So they may have been here for a few thousand years. We don't know. Um, I do believe that in heaven, that when it's, the Bible says there was war in heaven, before there was that war in heaven, that it could have been hundreds of years because if everybody on this earth has a guardian angel right now today there's what over seven billion people that means there's at least seven billion loyal angels in heaven well if a third of them fell and there was only seven billion that means that there would have been at least ten billion ten and a half billion angels how long would it have taken Lucifer to go to each one of those angels and talk to them and tempt them to follow him because they all had to stand the test? That could have taken hundreds of years. God knew what was going on, but God was very patient. And, you know, sometimes we get all in a big hurry and, and we wonder, how come God isn't coming back? We keep hearing God's coming back. Jesus is coming back. Well, He's got a timeline that's 6,000 years that we believe we've been here as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We believe about 6,000 years, and many of you watching do. That's a speck in a timeline that goes for eternity. So a few thousand years here is nothing to God. It's nothing. And what's taking God so long? He wants to give everybody the, the absolute opportunity to be saved. He wants as many people saved as possible. And as time continues on and the world becomes more and more wicked, eventually God's going to have to cut it short because if he doesn't, we will destroy ourselves. So that's why God's being patient with us. So on the seventh day, God blessed and he rested on the seventh day. And if we go to verse, th verse uh, 1 and chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis. I'm going to continue on here now. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, is that the complete truth? Well, not really. Because if we go back to, to chapter 2, and if we look at verse 17, it says, this is God speaking, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helpmate for him. 
So what did God say? He says, thou shalt not eat of it. Didn't say anything about touching it. That's a big point that we need to look at. Here's the reason why. Because we have this serpent that's in this tree. He's holding this fruit. Was he dead? Subconsciously, in Eve's mind, he was touching it. He was actually eating it. Let's read on. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You will not surely die. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? That's a lie that's still being told today. It's called immortality of the soul. There's a big belief in most churches that when you die, you go to heaven. Well, I don't know how that's possible, and we'll get into that later on down the road, but I want to plant something in your mind, just an idea. And it says here, when it talks about in chapter 1, Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 2. Here we go. Chapter 2. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Does that tell us that God breathed a soul into Adam? No. It says that God's breath came into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. So if you take away the breath, what do you have? You have the dust. And Jesus himself says in the New Testament, to dust you will return. So the idea that this living soul, this conscious being of some sort, goes to heaven and lives this blissful life and watches the rest of us down here, what kind of a heaven would that be? That would, that would, that would be terrible for them. And the reason it's being told to this day, and most people believe it with the state of the dead, is because that's the first lie that Satan told to Eve. The serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. It's right there. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Number 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband, and he did eat. Now there's a lot of problems right there. We're going to talk about this in a moment. First of all, in verse 4, Lucifer said, you're not going to die. That lie is still going on today. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. In other words, Lucifer was implying to Eve that God was keeping something back, that God was holding out on her that God are to doubt. Here he's eating this, this fruit. We say maybe an apple. We don't know if it was an apple. The Bible doesn't say that. It says it was fruit. Maybe it was a peach. I don't know. It doesn't matter. God said, don't touch it. No, he didn't. He said, don't eat of it. So even her mind is thinking to herself, well, let's see. God said, don't touch it. Don't eat of it. And this, this uh, beautiful serpent here is up in the tree, and he's holding this fruit, and he's eating it. And I can just picture drool coming down the sides of his mouth and and she's thinking to herself well i've never heard of a, a serpent being able to talk the bible tells us that the serpents had wings and they could fly so subconsciously eve is thinking to herself god's got to be holding something back because here's this serpent who's touching this and this serpent who can now speak because he's eating of this fruit, I definitely want what this guy's got or what this thing's got, what this serpent's got. I want what he's got. I don't care what God said. I'm sure God is holding out on me. So she took a bite of it quickly. 
Well, then she goes over and she gives some to her husband, to Adam. And he ate of it. And Adam knew, Adam knew what was going on. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. You ever find yourself at a dessert table? Boy, that looks good. It's full of sugar, full of empty carbs we don't need. I believe that probably the number one reason why most of us eat more than we should and eat things that we shouldn't eat is because it was a bit of a curse because of what happened at the Garden of Eden. I really believe that. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, see, here's this serpent eating this fruit and he could speak. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the, both of, and the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Why were they naked? Because there was a robe of light around them. And that robe of light was purity. It was God's robe of light. And when they sinned, God's spirit, God's light that would enshrouded them, left them. And they felt naked. Verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, I wonder, I can't prove it, but I wonder, does this says they heard the voice of the Lord God? It doesn't say that they saw God. Before they had seen God, God had been talking with Adam and Eve. He had been with them. They had communed together, but now it was only God's voice. I believe that once they had sinned, they could not see God anymore face to face. God had to hide himself. Maybe it was in a cloud or something like that, because we're told that sin cannot exist in God's presence, because God's presence would literally kill us, and therefore God had to protect Adam and Eve from that. From, from being, being killed by his light. But the Bible tells us one day that if we're faithful, we'll be able to see Jesus face to face. And Jesus is actually going to put a crown on our, on our heads and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's in Revelation. We'll get to that one day down the road. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. See, Adam didn't say, Lord. It doesn't say anything about, Lord, uh, I'm here, here I, I am. It doesn't say anything about Adam confessing to God and, and this conversation that went on as if they were speaking face to face. I believe at that point they could no longer see God face to face the way that they had before. They had to, again, they had to be held away maybe with a cloud or something like that. The same way that there was a cloud that covered Mount Sinai with Moses in the, in, the, in, the, in the desert. And when Moses was on that mountain, God passed by and God says, I'll turn my back to you because if you see my face, it's going to kill you. That can't happen. Sin is a very big thing. Sin is real. God cannot be in the presence of sin. Sin cannot be in the presence of God. And that is one reason why it's taking God so long to come and to take the redeemed back to heaven, take those that would be happy living in heaven, is because our characters must be molded. The Bible says that Jesus is the potter and we are the clay. And we must be molded. Our characters must be molded. And eventually we need to have a character that is reflective of the character of, of Jesus. So, verse 9, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? 
And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden when I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, why did, was he naked? Why did he hide himself? Because he knew that God's presence had left him. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Or have I commanded you that thou shouldest not eat? Verse 12. And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. The woman did it. It was the woman's fault. Not cool. The blame game started back in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now again, the blame game. How often do we look down the pew? Lord, I'm not so bad. Look at so-and-so. How often do we get on the phone and get on the, get on the gossip chain? Why do we gossip? Why do we talk about people? Is it because we truly care or is it because it makes us feel better about ourselves? Look at them. Look how bad they are. I, I'm not so, so bad. Verse 14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now there's a whole sermon in verse 15, and we'll get to that one day. Verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Well, that kind of that kind of puts a dampener on the idea that women are to be equal in every way, as the world has tried to make it. Now I'm married, and I'm happily married. My wife is happily married to me. She says she is. Been married for about 28 years. She takes care of the home. I go to work. She comes to work. I help her in the home. We're partners. We treat each other as equals. However, if there's some little thing that comes along that she's not sure about, she comes and asks me. And I do the same. If there's something I'm not sure about, I ask her. God created Adam and Eve. He created Eve to be by Adam's side. Not to be under Adam's feet. Not to be the head of Adam. That's why he took a rib out of her side. You can read that in Genesis chapter 2. A little homework assignment for you. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now if when we die, we go to heaven, why wouldn't so many people be happy to die if we really believe that? Right here it says, till re, it says here in verse 19, Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken. So when we die, that breath of life, goes back to God. You can't tell me that we have an, a conscious soul up in heaven that God takes and pulls out of heaven and puts into every little baby before it's born or when it takes that first breath. That would be pure torture. Verse 20. 
And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And to Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Now you think about that for a moment. God made coats of skin and clothed them. So, these coats of skin came from where? They came from lambs, from sheep. Why? Because God showed them that they had to have a sacrifice for their sin. Can you imagine them seeing those lambs die? Having to sacrifice those lambs, knowing that it was them who caused those lambs to be sacrificed, knowing that it was those lambs who were innocent, gave their life. And that's why further on in the Bible, Jesus is referred to, the, to a lamb. He referred to as a lamb to the slaughter. And we are referred to as lambs. Jesus is the good shepherd. We are the lambs. Why are we to be lambs? Because we're to be innocent. We are to follow the shepherd, the good shepherd. We're not to be goats. Remember years ago, our neighbor had a goat. He was a billy goat. He was about this tall, and that was his back. He was more like a Shetland pony. And he had about a 20-foot chain on him and a stake in the ground, and Billy loved to eat blackberries. And the second thing he liked to do was to push you with his head a little bit. And so even up until I was about 15, 16 years old, he, Billy was still around there at the neighbor's house. He was still alive. And he had big horns. And we knew, the neighbor, the neighbor told us, he says, don't let Billy have too much chain. He'll tempt you. He'll stand back a little bit, and he'll have about four or five feet of chain, and you walk up to him and push on his horns. He'll give you a push, and you'll end up on your backside. So we figured out that if we tempted him and got him closer to us and kind of egged him all on to get closer, the chain would tighten up a little bit, and there'd only be a couple feet of slack on the chain. And then when he pushed, he couldn't push into us and push us over. But he loved to wrestle and with, our, with his horns, and he'd move his head back and forth, and he'd push on you. That's the opposite of a lamb. A lamb would never do that. God wants us to be his lambs. He doesn't want us to push back. He doesn't want us to question his love. He doesn't want us to question the Bible. He doesn't want us to question what, he's, what he has done for us. So verse 23, let's pick it up at verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. There again, to till the ground from where man was taken. Man came from dust, from the dirt. Verse 24, So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Well, now we get on to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 is kind of a sad chapter. It talks about Cain and Abel. And we'll just, we'll get started on that here. It says, Adam knew his wife, and he conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In other words, when Abel made that offering, fire came down from heaven, consumed that offering. Then we have Cain. Cain, but unto Cain, in verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. This is God had no respect. And Cain was very wroth. So God did not accept Cain's offering. Why not? Well, because God did not tell Adam and Eve, when you have sinned, you need to bring some fruit. He says you need to bring a lamb. Why is that? Because fruit wasn't going to save us eventually. Eventually, the lamb would save us. And who was the lamb a representative of? A representative of Jesus. Jesus dying on that cross for us. 
That lamb was a representation of what would come in the future. And so Abel was, Abel was uh, very thankful that, that God uh, accepted his offering. And I can just imagine Abel walking over, looking over at Cain and saying, Cain, this is not what God wants. Because in verse 5 it says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And God said unto Cain, Why art thou mad? Why are you wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? And then God starts to, starts to try to reason with him. And it says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. In other words, Cain, don't be so upset because you're going to be in big trouble. You're going to get in trouble. God could see this coming. He knows the future. And he told Cain, he says, Cain, back off. Back off. I can't accept this. I know it's your best. I know this is the fruit, but this is not what I told you to do. Continue with verse 7. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, if you sin, if you sin, you're going to be, you're going to be, you, you take this to the next farthest step. Satan is going to be your leader. Satan's going to be your ruler. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So verse 8, as I just said a minute ago, Cain talked with Abel. I'm sure that Abel said, Cain, please. God said a lamb. And I'm sure there was an argument there that went on. How many times do we find ourselves in arguments with family members? You hear of of shootings and killings and people getting hurt, beat up by family members. Some family members die. Some family members end up in the hospital. Some family members go to the hospital. Some end up in jail. This has been going on from the beginning. And Satan is attacking our families today the same way that he attacked that family then, the same exact way. And the Lord said unto Cain, oh, let's back up, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I don't know him. I'm my brother's keeper. And he said, what have you done? This is God speaking. What have you done, Cain? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And then he tells Cain, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when you till the ground, it will not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth and it shall come pass that every one that findeth me will want to slay me and the Lord said to him therefore whosoever slayeth Cain vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold and the Lord set a mark upon Cain lest any find anyone finding him should kill him Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden so, was God merciful to Cain? Absolutely. Is God merciful to us? Absolutely. You know, when I was growing up, I had friends that we'd talk about things that were going on in the world, and we'd say how bad this person was or how bad that person was and how we just knew they were just going to burn in hell forever. We don't know. We don't know people's hearts. 
We don't know our own family members' hearts, our minds. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what their true feelings are, what their thoughts are. Only God knows. And that's why gossip is such a bad thing. Because we don't know. We don't know how God looks at them. Look how God looked at Cain. He spared Cain's life. He said, if anybody touches Cain, I will punish them seven times. Seven times worse. I'm going to punish them seven times worse. So even though Cain killed Abel, God still kept the door open for forgiveness. God spared Cain's life. No matter what we do, until the close of probation, no matter what we do, God wants our allegiance. God wants us to forgive others. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, if we don't forgive those who sin against us, how can God forgive us for our sins? And that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to forgive others. He doesn't want us to hold grudges. He wants us to. He wants us to go the second mile, the third mile, the fourth mile with our brothers, with our sisters, with our neighbors, our friends. He wants us to. He wants us to have the same character that Jesus had on this earth. That's what Jesus came to this earth for. He showed us what needed to be done. That's why he said, that's why he said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus doesn't give up easy. He doesn't want to give up on you. So, no matter how bad you feel about something, maybe you've done in the past or maybe something that might happen in the future, no matter how bad someone is, if you believe in prayer, pray for them. Because when you look at the story of Cain and Abel, God persevered with Cain. He kept the door open. He didn't want Cain to dead. He wanted Cain to live. We know that Cain never did turn back to God. Cain was the father of the Canaanites. And a very bad group of people that gave, gave the children of Israel and Moses a lot of grief when they were in the wilderness. And God told them eventually, go in and wipe out Canaan. They lived in the best land of the, in the country. God is long-suffering for me, and he's long-suffering for you. And yes, the devil is here. His angels are around us. But God has angels also around us and we if we must ask for his presence daily satan is mighty but god is almighty let's pray father in heaven I want to thank you again for taking care of us I want to thank you for these for these bible stories for the things that are written written in the bible for us to help us to see a, a little bit of a glimpse of your character and the long suffering that you're willing to give us and how you, how you work with us and you woo us and, and you want us to let go of the things of this earth. You, you want us just to trust you explicitly, 100%. Have no questions. You want us to be as sheep. You want us to follow. You don't want us to be goats and be pushing back at you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.